Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Paraspar's new lecture series, Art and Science. This series explores the work that bring together the two traditionally disparate domain, art and science, in exciting new ways and ourselves in novel possibilities. We are very happy today to begin this lecture. We have today uh, Sukhan Saran, who has been a pioneer in bridging the gap between science and art and has been creating spectacular works. To give a brief introduction, uh, Sukhan Saran is a physicist turned artist and works at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. He considers uh, art as a compelling means of self-expression and communication. His abstract pen works have been shown in two ex exhibitions, um, me Meditation in 1998 and Mindscapes in 2001 at Nehru Center, Mumbai. He has held four exhibitions of science-based art titled Scientific Art, a Creative Interaction in 2006 at IISC Bangalore and TFI, TIFR Mumbai, Sci, uh, Sites at, uh, in 2009 at TIFR, Scales, Micrograph Photo Montages in 2012 at TIFR and Punjab University. The most recent one is titled Sculpting Sciences and Exper an Experiment in Art, which uh, comprised of 24 sculptures, was held at TIFR Mumbai in June this year. Since 2012, he has been involved in creating sculptures combined, combining scientific concepts with uh, aesthetics of form. We, are, we now request uh, Sukhan Saran to deliver his talk and take us through his amazing concepts and creations. Uh, okay, so I'll share my screen. Okay, I am audible and visible to everybody. Yes. The screen is also full. Uh, Okay. Full screen, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everyone. And uh, I thank Paraspar and Vitosta for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to present my work. So, thank you. And uh, so, let us uh, start with the fact that science and art are generally understood to be two different realms. And science is extroverted, it's external, and describes the external world, whereas art is introverted and depicts the inner world. Science is intellect-oriented, and art gives importance to emotions. Science deals with reasoning, deductive logic, and calculation, whereas art is intuitive. Both the creation and appreciation of art are primarily intuitive. Science insists on objectivity, whereas art celebrates subjectivity. Science is a collective work and seeks consensus, whereas art is individualistic. So we see that actually the differences which are perceived by the society between science and art are not unfounded, there are very good reasons for them to be considered. Yet, despite these differences, they, they have many things in common. And both are human activities which are inspired by close observation of nature. Both are representations of the reality. If there is a reality uh, somewhere and uh, outside, us and they try to represent that reality. Both use abstractions and we will come to this aspect later in the talk. Both use uh, abstraction not only to understand but also to communicate and both are concerned with, uh, you know, both claim actually that they they, they claim to be meaningful and they claim to be telling the truth. Of course, the definition of truth, etc., varies, but they, the claim is that they are meaningful and they are true. And both of them are deeply connected with beauty. And it is the last aspect which I will be concentrating on this talk. So let us go to the talk, the way the talk is organized. So first we will learn something about beauty, what beauty is, and then we will describe some aspects of the artistic beauty 
this is the intersection of art and beauty in particular i will refer to abstraction in art and then we will see where beauty is found in science this is the intersection of science and beauty and we will be talking about the aesthetic aspect of science then we will see some of the historical examples of interaction of science and art and after that we'll get acquainted with the modern science based art and see some examples of it and then i will describe my work which is at the intersection of science art and beauty so what is beauty beauty is innate in human nature beauty is a inner feeling which is very easy to understand but very difficult to define when we see something be beautiful we can easily tell that it is beautiful everyone has an aesthetic sense and that is not taught it cannot be taught we don't need any logic or calculation not everybody's aesthetics is the same yet there are things which most of the human beings in most of the cultures would find beautiful so let us just look at some of the examples natural beauty is scattered all around and beauty in nature is perhaps the most agreed upon assertion of beauty beauty of flowers has been given priority in every human culture this aesthetic is ingrained in our social and religious lives people find other people beautiful this aesthetic sense occupies a very important place in our personal and social lives and in fact this is the basis of attraction and it gives perhaps it gives direction to the evolution as well children whether they are of human beings or of animals they are also considered beautiful by almost everybody and we seek beauty we can find beauty anywhere beauty can also be felt in a stump of an old tree and smoke coming out of an incense stick makes different shapes and that is also very beautiful so what the aesthetic experience poets writers philosophers artists have discussed the aesthetic experience in great detail and from various perspectives so literature on aesthetics is extremely vast and there are many many interpretation but we will not go into all those details perhaps all that discussion boils down to two simple questions that are things intrinsically beautiful or does beauty lie in the eyes of the beholder so keeping aside all the controversy i think we can very safely generalize that the aesthetic sense is essentially an interplay between the subject and the object i mean it's a very general definition but i think it keeps away from all the controversies as well and there must be a biological basis to the aesthetic experience and it has must have played a very crucial role in the evolution of human and human mind mind readily identifies order pattern rhythm harmony simplicity etc so many qualities uh, which are just uh, you know a matter of microseconds and you know that you know something is ordered or not ordered with whether it there is a pattern and things like that so it readily identifies these things so beauty fills our life if we do not have aesthetic sense then our lives will not only become dull but unbearable beauty negates the bitterness and the cruelty of life beauty is not only our attitude and feeling it is a necessary condition for living
so let us look at the arctic beauty and it looks like that hu natural beauty is just not, not enough for human beings so they have to create art and art can be inspired of course by natural beauty and art has been created in every phase of history from the earliest times to the great civilizations our aesthetic sense is so overpowering that it compels us to create art actually in this particular thing there is a great abstraction involved also that those men who were living you know 25000 years ago in caves they were used to the three dimensional world and i i mean i am always amazed that they could realize that this two three dimensions can be abstracted to two dimensions it's a remarkable achievement actually which is should be considered at par as the achievements of language and things like that so there will be hardly a person who has not been overwhelmed by the beauty of taj mahal however this beauty is not natural this is a man made beauty so in some sense probably it can be said that man made beauty is art constitutes art so but artists bring beauty to their art in many many ways so there is this famous sculpture of michael angelo in which jesus christ is depicted in the lap of mother mary after being taken down from the crucifix so this artwork has been made employing so the so called realistic techniques the creases of the clothing the body muscles the facial expressions are real the artist has sculpted them just as they are perceived in reality the beauty of this art lies in its realistic depiction but all art is not realistic realistic art is just one genre of art in fact most of the artists do not follow realism in their art they only show some selected aspect of the scene or a person as we see in the next example and this is ancient sculpture found in indus valley the face the eyes ears beard hair clothes forehead ornament forehead ornaments nothing is realistic all these things are indicated but the sculpture is wonderfully lyrical and expressive and conveys a coherent theme very successfully the artist's aim is not to show reality it is to elicit an emotional response the expression of that feeling is the beauty of this art the artist is not copying nature he is changing what is in nature according to his understanding and his aesthetic sense this is a very powerful and illustrative example of abstraction while the artist may have a real object in mind the object might be stylized distorted or exaggerated using colors textures materials to communicate a feeling or an idea rather than to to produce a replica so this painting is by jahangir sabawala and it uses abstraction in a very innovative manner the painting is titled seagulls and sails but the birds and the sail boats are not even depicted clearly you can't even make out proper outlines of the birds or the boats but using a very clever combination of colors and lines sabawala has created an impression as if sailing boats are moving fast in the middle of the sea and the white birds are hovering around them the beauty of this painting is in creating a sense of movement and intense activity so these two artworks which we saw the indus valley sculpture and this painting uh, they are depicting something some person or something some object with some effort we can identify that person or thing in them 
but there is also a form of abstract art that is completely non-representational. This takes abstraction to an entirely new level. So Andy Goldsworthy, he has broken the stones which he found on the beach and he has reassembled them and he has created a shape. And this, the, the, so the light white markings are also being done by rubbing the stone on each other. No person or a thing is depicted here. The beauty of this artwork lies in the shape of the unexpected and the unique way of making it. So this is a purely abstract work. So we see that artist draws inspiration from nature, selects certain aspects, takes something from his own personality and puts it in the artwork. So it can be said that creation of art is the creation of beauty. So abstraction in the art is a visual language of line, shape, form, color, and texture. Abstraction exists in all arts to a certain degree. Even the most realistic art will actually have a lot of abstraction in it. And abstraction allows humans to see with their minds what they cannot see physically with their eyes. So now let us look at the another intersection, the science and aesthetic. So science is a human enterprise. It has dramatic, beautiful, tragic, comic, novel, grotesque, or sublime elements, just like any other enterprise, you know, maybe shoemaking, maybe space travel, anything. So science also has those elements which, uh, which come to it because it's a human enterprise. The aesthetics of science is to be identified actually first in the act of doing science. So when you do science, there is excitement of the novel, there is thrill of discovery, there is pleasure in day-to-day -day research, and there is delight in development of an idea. And uh, there is, of course, joy of understanding. And science is the rational description of nature. And the three things that the science studies and describes are basically objects, processes, and concepts. So let us look at the aesthetic aspects of these three. So the, uh, the aesthetic of doing science is essentially a personal thing which drives many people. And there is an aesthetics in the, the explanation, the description of various things. So I'm just distinguishing between these two, you know, uh, explicit and implicit uh, aesthetics. So beauty of the object. So this is a pinwheel galaxy. It, it can easily become a source of inspiration for astronomer or for anybody. Actually. <clears throat> beauty of the object. And the beauty of the object is small. For that, a galaxy is a huge thing. This molecule is a very small thing. But the structural beauty of molecules can overwhelm and inspire chemists. But in science, beauty is not only found in things. The processes that take place in nature are also extremely beautiful. The process of cell division is a complex thing and which is very, very fascinating. We will come to this aspect a little later. So this picture depicts the process of spreading of an oil layer on the surface of water. So anthropomorphic figures are making this process attractive and beautiful. So the processes can be found beautiful. But then there is a beauty of concept, apart from objects and processes. 
it is the beauty of principles and hypotheses as they are seen in science. So let's look at some examples. A widespread recurring theme is that of hierarchy and classification. So there is a wonderful hierarchy in the structure of the universe. We live on Earth, and uh, which is a planet in the solar system. The sun is one of the many stars in the Milky Way. And there are clusters of galaxies. Milky Way, which is a galaxy, and there are clusters of galaxies. These clusters form super clusters. And then the universe, the observable universe, is created from superclusters. So we see a hierarchy from smaller to bigger structure. On the other hand, you can go from smaller to bigger. Matter is simply uh, made up of molecules and atoms, and electrons and nuclei are to be found in the atom. The nuclei are composed of protons and neutrons, and which are which in turn are made up of quarks. Now, this this of course there is a hierarchy and there is a gradation and there is such a beautiful uh, you know sequence to the structure of matter. And each at each scale, the, the dynamics is different. And but these scales in both the cases of universe and in the case of structure of matter are obvious. But we are so enamored by the concept of hierarchy and classification that we apply them to even those systems where the distinctions are not so obvious, such as the living matter. I mean, the biological classification is, is, is mind-boggling. And, and, and so is the geologic, the classification of geological time. Okay, and then there, there are so many other examples. So one of the functions of science is to classify, and that makes science beautiful. Symmetry also plays a very important role in science, especially physics. Symmetry also creates a sense of beauty. But at the same time, na nature often deviates from symmetry. And the broken symmetry, the asymmetry, also has an aesthetic appeal. So symmetry and asymmetry, which are both found in nature, uh, contribute to the beauty of science. Then there is a beauty of complexity and simplicity. And if the contrast is the same, the complexity of nature is considered to be understood when science is able to provide a simplified picture. Both complexity and simplicity evoke an aesthetic response. There is beauty in complexity and there is beauty in simplification. But this, this simplification of complexity is achieved by finding patterns. When there is complexity, when we are encountering complexity and we find a pattern in it, we, we have this feeling that we have understood it. And rhythm is basically a pattern in time. So finding these patterns, recognizing these patterns and rhythms and explaining them is the achievement of scientists. And that is aesthetically very satisfying. So what we see in these examples that we find beauty in objects, processes, concepts brought out by recognition of hierarchy, symmetry, uh, patterns, complexities, you know, etc. all these things. So you would also recall that these are the very same attributes perceived by the mind that make anything beautiful. So it can be said with great confidence that the quote unquote reasons for attributing beauty to nature or art are exactly the same ones that would make science beautiful. So now let me just go to the, in, some of the historical examples of the interaction of science and art. Uh, this is a very, uh, the history is long and rich and actually it will take another lecture to talk about it in some detail. Here I will just give you some examples to highlight many diverse ways in art and science have been influencing each other. 
So this picture is found in a 13th century French Bible. In this, God is shown creating the universe. The thing to note is that God is creating the universe by measurement and calculation. Now, this is very interesting because this concept is the central pillar of science. Science believes that universe is made according to a plan, according to some rules, and those plans and rules can be discovered by logical reasoning and calculations. It is surprising and intriguing that we find this notion in the uh, artwork of a religious book 300 years almost before Newton, 200 years before Galileo. So talking about Galileo, my second example is actually about Galileo drawing. So when Galileo studied the moon with his telescope, he made some sketches to explain it, you know, to, to, to describe it to other people. But he did not know how to draw properly. And his drawings were rather strange and not very convincing. So Galileo was unable to explain his research to others. And then Galileo learned the method of making artistic images. And he made these wash drawings of the moon. And these paintings were much more convincing and people began to believe Galileo, in Galileo's words. So modern science, we say, is supposedly has begun with Galileo. And from the very beginning, we see an association of science and art. A very good example of the interaction of science and art is to be found in the science of color. So simultaneous contrast was discovered by a French scientist named Chevrel. The letters of the letters of simultaneous contrast, they are written in red. Now what I'll do is I will put a background to it, which is blue on one side and yellow on the other side. So let your eyes get a little adjusted to it. And then you will see that the red on the blue side is very different from the red on the yellow side. So the red color on the blue background looks different from the red color on a yellow background. So how the color will look depends on not only that color, but what is what color is there in the background. This is the principle of simultaneous contrast. If we remove the background, it goes back to the same red color. The same happens with other colors also. So I'm just putting some green color and you can see that the green looks different with the background. The same is with the purple. So I cannot go into the details, the scientific details of it here, but from this, it was established that colors are not just a matter of wavelength and receptors in the retina, but are formed somewhere deep in the brain. And that led to many, many advances in the theory of color and the, the way color is, the, the way we understand the perception of color. But this inspired an artist to do something extraordinary. So Sura gave a creative twist to this scientific theory. This entire picture is made up of small colored dots. So we'll focus on one small area. And here you can see uh, some building and uh, you can also see uh, two figures of human beings and you can see a flag and mountains and a, sky, a bit of a sky and part of the mountain. They can also be seen. And now let us expand this. So we now actually see the color dots by which the, the artist has very cleverly used the dots of colors, which when viewed from a distance 
make the color of the building the color of the human the figures of the human the figures of the humans are not even discernible when you look very close and the mountain and the sky and all these details have not been painted explicitly but they are being created in our mind and that influenced the invention of the four color printing so a color picture on the printed on a paper is made up of only four colors so dots of cyan magenta yellow and black the famous cmyk they are printed one after the other at different angles to Uh, get a particular color depending on how many dots of yellow how many dots of cyan how many dots of so we see the science and art are interacting in in a in a in a really wonderful way so there is another very important relationship between science and art the structure of human body is very complex and a photograph cannot show the extraordinary amount of detail clearly in order to explain and teach artistic drawings of the body, of the body structures were made in which every detail is clearly shown and now medical art is a separate discipline and many prominent medical schools have actually departments of medical art millions of medical professionals around the world learn the structure and functioning of human body thanks to the skill patience dedication and the vision of medical artists so this these examples are from the history and now i would like to give you uh, some examples from what we understand as the modern science art so many times it happens that the scientists will find something during their work in their work which creates an illusion of being artistic so the, this picture has expressive life like biomorphic forms and they can be discerned in the photo and they also ev evoke a very strong and a distinct feeling however this is not art the artist has not put anything from his side into it it's a happy coincidence but this is not art but there are many examples of the science based art and let us see some of those so there are many things and processes which are scientifically studied but we cannot see them or cannot be seen and they exist or perhaps they exist only in the minds of scientists the scientific analysis and calculations have revealed information about pairs of stars in which gas from one star revolves around the other star and gets into it so they are so far away that they cannot be photographed the artistic depiction of such a process helps you know scientists and students to visualize what is happening the depiction of scientific facts is done according to the imagination of the artist and this is a form of science art the second mode of science based art uses the scientific tools and techniques so this artwork is made from mri scans so marilyn oliver took a number of mri scans of the human body at various points along its length and then stacked together to create a very unique sculpture of the human body a three dimensional inner portrait this is a close up of that so we see that now a technique has been used to create something which is explicitly artistic there is another form of science based art which is based on scientific principles or facts so this artwork is based on surface tension so normally a metal pin would will sink in water but we if we increase the tension by coating the pin with a thin layer of oil the same pin will float so robert anderson placed a grill of parallel bars at the bottom of container which was illuminated and the floating pin deformed the surface of water in a way the heavy object would deform a foam mattress so the curved surface started acting as lenses making this image very unique and beautiful 
some artworks are based on scientific facts but artists take liberties and introduce their own interpretation and aesthetic judgment so green fluorescent protein glows green when illuminated by blue or ultraviolet light and this protein is used to image the internal structure of cell under a microscope the actual structure of this protein is very complex and the artist has simplified that complex structure according to his imagination and inclination so now i so we have seen that abstraction which we saw earlier in the context of art is occurring in science based art as well so it is possible to create abstract art that reflects the beauty of science my own work is of that nature but before i show you my sculptures i would like to give you a flavor of the kind of work that i did earlier so my artistic journey started with abstract pen work two themes dominated my abstract art duality and entanglement so we i encountered duality at every stage of our lives the dualities of good and bad high and low past and present external and internal mind and body and so many others and our lives are entangled within a much larger and a complex matrix of relationship both uh, professional social uh, you know personal every all kinds of relationships and uh, we are entangled in that relationships so these themes kept ap uh, making appearance in my uh, uh, you know sculptures as well as we'll see later the second strand of my work was the science based digital art so this is an atom consists of a nucleus around which the electrons revolve and atom is extremely small and the nucleus is million times smaller so if we imagine atom to be as big as a cricket stadium then the nucleus would be as small as the broken tip of a rice grain so textbook diagrams of the atom are actually grossly this it distorted because it is not possible to show the proportional size you know in, in a picture in a diagram so electrons are mostly on the upper surface of the atom and the atom is empty from inside hollow like a bubble so when we walk on the solid ground made up of atoms we are walking on bubbles but i mean that's not very unusual because we are also made up of the same bubbles so these two strands of my work the abstract drawings and the science based digital images came together in my sculptures my sculptures are hand built with clay i begin with a scientific idea and play with form in such a way that the aesthetic and the scientific content find a balance i hope my sculptures would be aesthetically meaningful even to the viewer who is not aware of the underlying science and uh, now i will give you some of the examples of my work not in any chronological order but with uh, but i have clubbed them according to some themes so there is this famous story about newton that he was sitting under the apple tree and the apple fell on his head and he started thinking about that and the theory of gravity was discovered i mean this is is clearly a made up of story nevertheless his great achievement was to create a law that explain both the force of gravity which brings down the apple is the same gravitational force which keeps the moon in the orbit so in this sculpture the cratered surface of the moon and the apple shape have been juxtaposed to make newton's apple. so every culture accords a special status to trees and they have been extensively used to represent life growth knowledge environment among many other things most of these depictions show only the portion of the tree seen above the ground but that's a incomplete representation scientifically 
the tree as a life form is spread out below the ground as much as above it so the root system of the tree is an integral part of the tree this sculpture shows the complete structure of the tree in a symbolic way so everyday life is replete with objects and processes whose scientific aspects are not only fascinating but can also be interpreted artistically a cup of hot tea has these randomly moving molecules in it and some of them acquire enough speed to break the surface barrier the emerging molecules condense into small droplets on contacting the uh, cooler air and these droplets come together to form the wisps of the steam the dynamics of this coalescence is complicated and not very well understood and i have you know tried to aesthetically extend extend the science of evaporation and coalescence whatever i could understand from on this so ductility is the ability to draw wires out of metals and it is the basis of a huge number of technological innovations from distribution of electricity to electronic microcircuitry nevertheless the physics of ductility has remained rather obscure so this sculpture imagines uh, the insides of a stretching wire where the microscopic crystalline chips of metal slide past each other in a orchestrated manner a related thing is the malleability which is closely related to ductility and it is understood that the microscopic process at the atomic level would not be very different in the two cases so this sculpture just like the other one visualizes microscopic crystalline chips rearranging themselves as the metal is beaten into a sheet so i have already talked about dualities that define our lives but there are dualities in science as well and they provide an intriguing glimpse into the metaphysical dimensions of science and i have tried to depict some of these dualities in my sculptures so science is a fundamentally a quest for order in a complex and a disordered world in nature we find order and disorder merging into each other seamlessly so here i show a solid whose molecules are arranged regularly is melting into a liquid and which is made up of randomly moving molecules so in quantum mechanics particles are waves and waves are particles so this duality permeates all the modern physics so in this sculptures if you look at from bottom to top the particles are coalescing to make waves or if you look from top to bottom the waves are becoming localized particles so this wave particle duality has been represented in this sculpture <clears throat> theories of physics postulate the existence of antimatter whose property are opposite to that of matter antimatter was discovered in a process of pair production where a gamma ray gets converted into a electron positron pair the exact mechanism of the tra transformation is again not very clear but there can be speculations and there are many speculations so i have taken a liberty to employ the concept of the half turn of the mobius strip to depict the particle and antiparticle production now the duality has components it has two components okay so imagine a w shape curve representing one component of the duality and a m shape curve would represent a mirror image would re represent the other aspect of duality the other component of it now if these are brought together so this would 
form the complete representation of the reality where the two the two components of duality are interacting incidentally this sculpture has a very strong resemblance to feynman diagrams which are actually very clever devices to describe the interaction of subatomic particles so the interaction of duality and the interaction of subatomic particles those both ideas get fused in this sculpture mathematical forms maybe i should skip this one okay uh space and time so modern science began with the mathematical description of space and time so initially they were considered independent of each other and of matter so einstein's theory of relativity fused space time and matter in very unusual way it is accepted today that space and time were created at the so called big bang and since then they have been expanded so this peculiar and a counterintuitive notion posits that any observer in the universe irrespective of the, its own position would find the space expanding in all directions so this sculpture incorporates the notions of space geometry and expansion so while the large scale structure of space is intriguing enough the nature of space at the very small scale is equally bizarre the space in the tiniest of the volume is never empty it is permeated by so called quantum fields which show small random fluctuation in their values at any given point and it has been theorized that virtual particles are being constantly created and destroyed in the so called empty space so these virtual particles cannot be observed directly that's why they are called virtual but their cumulative effects have been measured and we know we take them as now a reality so this sculpture actually depicts the ceaseless activity of the vacuum at the ultra microscopic level the mystery of time is truly mind boggling and science is in some ways still struggling with it the time is also a preoccupation of philosophers and artists however there is a distinction between physical and psychological time time for physicist is a fourth dimension in addition to the th three of the space and is represented essentially by a line the psychological time on the other hand has deep connection with consciousness and memory i mean you you sometimes forget some things you don't remember and uh, sometimes memories come back you know sometimes the time you 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 think the time is not passing and sometimes hours will pass and you will not know how they have passed so the psychological perception of time is very different from the way time is represented in science and this culture emphasizes this dichotomy the smooth cylinder represents the linear time of physics and the curvy projections depict the the way mind perceives time okay so i have some time more with me and so now i would like to show you a a series of sculptures about embryonic development this development of a complete body from the single fertilized egg which keeps on dividing and differentiating is both complicated and beautiful the fertilized eggs divides into two and then four and then more cells so let me show you some of the things which i have tried to represent so this the two cell state is depicted here and the complex there is a complex dynamics which is taking place inside and which is suggested by the those motifs the contours on the surface of the cells so as the numbers of cells increase and reach about 30 they start 
to actually look like a mulberry fruit with a mass of cells called marula and this is a sculpture of you know these cells coming together and you know they are forming the marula before the compactification happens and further things happen so this phase is depicted in this sculpture next we must understand that there are different types of cells in the developed body so skin cells are completely different from brain cells muscle cells are different from interstitial cells and the in the beginning all the cells are similar and as the embryo develops cells differentiate but the first differentiation of the cells occur at this stage the outer cells of the marula are different from the inner cells of marula because the outer cells are exposed to the outer environment and the inner cells are exposed only to the other cells and that differentiation takes place the outer cells of marula form a hollow cavity and the inner cells are deposited on one side of the cavity and which a small macquit uh, depicting this stage was made the inner it is this inner cell group that develops further so the inner cell group now lifts itself and forms two cavities you know this uh, just, just hold on please so it forms two cavities this cavity and that cavity and these two layer layers are again exposed to different cavities so uh, the this side of the uh, the inner cell group develops differently and that side of the inner cell develops differently and those are called epiblast and hypoblast so the two cells to a bilaminar embryonic disk is formed in this process in this way and here is a sculpture and i have taken the artistic liberty to depict the bilayer as curved and to indicate rising of that it rises from the side to almost to the center of the cavity now at this stage there is no polarity that where the head will be where the but there is a impending polarity and the motif which is used uh, at in the back is basically uh you know suggesting the impending polarity so a structure called primitive streak is formed in the epiblast one of the two layers the appearance of the primitive streak is at establishes the bilateral left right symmetry of the thing and i have made a sculpture using that concept and these ideas basically resulted in this the primitive streak the thing to note is that primitive streak is formed where the future trunk would be so the head would be formed later somewhere here actually the it it is the lower portion of our body which is formed first so the first visible signs of our body is made when where our bottom would be i think this fact alone should make us humble so appearance of the primitive streak in the epiblast is actually the result of a biochemical process that takes uh, that takes place in the hypoblast the two layers are actually interacting they and they are interacting in very complex way so in this sculpture i have taken the liberty to show the two layers separately highlighting the interaction between them so we go further by the 17th day a third layer starts coming in coming uh, starts forming in between the two and which is known as the mesoderm the, the mesoderm is actually made up of epiblast cell the upper layer which then move down the path of the primitive streak and push down the hypoblast below the upper layer now is called the ectoderm and the lower layer is called the endoderm so ectoderm mesoderm endoderm are the three layers and around 
at this stage the ectoderm starts what is known as the invagination and by 20, we have a well developed groove called the neural groove this is called the neural groove this groove later separates from the ectoderm and to form a neural tube that and it joins the mesoderm and thus begins the formation of the spinal cord and the brain the process of folding separating from the first layer after folding then twisting and separating goes on continuously most of the body parts are built in this way the sculpture shows the invagination of the ectoderm i have not shown the mesoderm here to form a neural tube which later will develop into the spinal cord and brain now this is the scene the same scene at 20 days which is seen from the above so the, the, here the neural tube is is is, uh, is being formed by day 22 the neural tube begins to close and the mesoderm big has be, begun to form structure called somites so around that you have this somite structures which are the mesodermic structures and these are the progenitors of the vertebrae uh, vertebra also and a day later the zipping is complete so this sculpture was made to depict the process of folding and zipping again looking at from the a different angle altogether so now look at the, let's look at this scene from the side we just looked at the scene from the top now this is the side so folding is not happening only in just one layer so all the three layers elongate and twist in such a way that the endoderms form the gut tube you know this, it forms a gut tube and the interst uh, and where, where the intestines will form the intestinal tract becomes narrower and which later develops into the umbilical cord so broadly speaking the ectoderm makes the outer skin the mesoderm apart from the vertebrae makes the other bones and muscles the endoderm makes the lining of the gut and the organs as the side branching of the gut tube so just 4 weeks after the fertilization the embryo has started looking like this faint echoes of human form are just discernible the development has been unbelievably fast the buds that will grow into lip, limbs have appeared the complete set of vertebrae have formed the embryo now has a working central nervous system and a primitive heart that is pumping blood and also it has a circulatory system that is carrying the blood to different parts of the embryo so this sculpture has been made as an abstract picture of this creature so almost all organs have started to form and are functioning to some extent the developing limb buds the eyes the internal organs have been indicated through stylized motifs on the surface this creature one or two centimeters long is starting its life in the mother's womb and the mother is actually still unaware of its existence in the coming 8 months it would grow and all its body parts will be fully developed and then it will be born now there is an issue of the onset of consciousness and which has been debated a lot so when does consciousness begin we are of course conscious now and we were yeah we were conscious at the time of birth as well and we were conscious even when we were there in the womb but were we conscious in the early stages of embryonic development in my view our fear is conscious is sensing thinking and perhaps dreaming as well so let me conclude here with this that the 
objective is not at war with the subjective they are mutually reinforcing aspects inclusion of aesthetics in the scientific discourse enhances the perception of the natural world artistic expression of scientific thought is yet another way of doing science and i will end my talk with a quotation that there is no science without fiction and there is no art without facts and thank you all for listening patiently to me thank you so much for the talk there are many points you mentioned that are you know food for thought and to ponder upon so uh, i am open for questions if there are any yes there is one hand raised pratik can you unmute yourself and ask the question No, ma'am. I was just appreciating the talk. Okay. Just clapping emoji. Oh, you're clapping, not raising your hand. Okay. Anybody has a question? Can ask. Uh, unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can type in your question in the chat box, and I can uh, read it out for you. Yeah, there is some. Uh, there is a hand here. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, like, uh, what? Uh, my question is, what? What's your uh, intention behind using clay as the medium? Ah, okay, that's a good because uh, it's Actually, uh, yeah, like uh, clay uh, is a difficult medium to work with. Uh, yes, it's not uh, yeah. it's not easy medium. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me uh, an answer this question. Actually, I initially I started. very randomly and i tried metal, working with metal and wood and many other things and but i slowly came to clay and the reason for that was that there is a flexibility which the clay gives you although it's difficult to work i mean difficult to work with in the sense once you know how to work with it then it's not so difficult but uh, what, the clay gives me, me a flexibility and the, it is as uh, it's very satisfying to work with clay the i mean the, there is a whole lot of spirituality attached with actually working with clay with hands and uh, i i and this it's very fascinating but the most you know the important reason for my using clay is that i am depicting very modern ideas of science and to juxtapose it with clay which is the most ancient medium of artistic expression you know has a particular appeal which fascinates me very much uh, so that's why the reason i i use clay thank you there is a question in the chat box uh, yeah please i will read it out it is by uh, brandon Yeah. wonderful talk could you talk about how aesthetic experience or artistic experience has helped improve your own scientific understanding well i would i don't know whether it has improved my understanding but my choice of reading in science is always driven by aesthetics so whatever i understand if i do not see the beauty of it probably i don't understand so i don't know whether it has improved my understanding or how how uh, i would not say it has improved my understanding i would say it has directed my understanding okay any more question narmada says excellent talk in the chat box will this wait for one minute more if there is any question yeah sure uh good evening everyone i have a question uh, please go on yeah. uh, 
Uh, so, sir, uh, you said that beauty uh, motivates you to uh, pick and choose certain things to uh, study in science. Yes. So, uh, what would your take be on how science progresses based on how uh, humans are be uh, perceive beauty? So, the direction in which science goes ahead. Yeah. How does beauty influence yeah. right. it? So this is a uh, actually a question which has been debated a lot by the philosophers and sociologists of science. In fact, Brandon is probably um, a better uh, person to answer this question. Uh, yeah, so some scientists feel that the scientific progress actually occurs only through beauty, whether you know it or not. And, but there is an opposing view as well, which says that you know, beauty has got nothing to do with it. And in fact, they go even to the extent that if you just follow beauties, uh, then you would actually uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, get into a wrong uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, theory. So, I mean, so there are examples where a theory has progressed, where an idea has progressed because you know, it, its beauty has been uh, uh, this thing uh, uh, where the, uh, the beauty has been pursued. And there are theories which have been developed where, you know, people have developed because they are moved by the aesthetic sense, but then the theories have proved not to be correct. Okay, so both the things are, uh, I don't think it's a very settled question. Uh, personally, I think, uh, beauty motivates more to do science uh, rather than the historical progress of science probably is not as, uh, as uh, driven by aesthetics, but the personal, uh, the aesthetic drives the person who, who, who is doing science and who is understanding science. There is a question by Narmada. Um... What yeah. triggered your interest in, in biological phenomena since you yourself are a physicist? Uh, I just happened to read a, a popular uh, book, actually. <laughs> uh, and I was so fascinated by it that I came very late to it. And I had the uh, stupidity and the arrogance of all physicists who said that, oh, biology, I mean, who cares for biology? And, you know, for a long time, I... And then I came across this wonderful book and I just read it and I, I, my whole thinking about biology changed. And then I started reading it. I started reading textbooks. Uh, so it happened quite um, accidentally, actually. Uh, the next question. Uh, uh, okay. Which book was it? Uh, uh, okay, connected. this book I have forgotten the name of the author. The name, uh, the name of the book is Life Itself. Okay, and okay. some something about the you know cell. It, it, it's a popular book on uh, cellular biology, Life Itself. Okay. I, uh, if you write to me at my this, uh, this thing, I, I I will be able to give you the exact details. It's an Oxford University Press publications. Um, I have right now. I am not remembering the. Uh, name of the author, uh, but it, the, the the title of the book is Life Itself. The next question, I would love to know what's your next work. Uh, what's your next work would be towards visualization of biological event? Ah, okay. Um, so um, actually, it's it's uh, while doing this biology thing, I also realized that I am now getting uh, into a wider field. You know, when I came out of physics, I first encountered uh, biology, but now I am encountering many, many fields. And my, uh, so recent uh, obsession is actually earth sciences and not biology. Uh, so I, I am now right now making, in the process of making variety of sculptures and uh, some of them I have already made also uh, about the you know geological processes and the atmospheric processes um, and various things. So I, I guess biosphere is a, is a very important part of the uh, uh, you know Earth, uh, various spheres on Earth, and uh, 
I mean, somewhere it will merge. I mean, I cannot actually say that how I am going to, uh, I mean, which area of biology I am going to this thing. But yeah, I mean, somewhere it will definitely make an appearance uh, because, uh, you know, we know that biosphere affects in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, even the actually the, the uh, lithosphere and biosphere themselves are interacting in, in a, and I am getting more and more interested in these aspects. So let us see where it takes. Uh, so it, it will not be um, directly something about biology, but yes, uh, uh, yeah, it will be a part of the, uh, my thinking, definitely. Joel P says, thank you for the excellent talk. Bibhuti says, thank you for the enlightening and beautiful lecture, sir. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Are there any more questions from the audience? Okay, I think there are no more questions. So thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. And this is a very fitting, uh, you know, inauguration to us, uh, this lecture series on art and science. Thank you so much. And we hope to have more interaction with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your works are appealing and aesthetic in their presentation. When your sculptures are displayed uh, without notes, can they be misinterpreted or do, do they always have to go with uh, notes to describe concepts? So when I have exhibited them in an exhibition, I have always kept a little explanation along with the thing. But there, there are always visitors in the, uh, to the exhibition uh, who, uh, who don't really care for it. And, uh, you, you know, uh, so, um, and their response uh, has been in general very positive. So I have a feeling that they respond to the, the uh, aesthetics of it uh, and they give it their own interpretations. I have shown it to some fri uh, friends uh, who are not from science. And they all say that we don't know, but we can interpret it in in variety of ways, and it, it it's it's quite an open ended. So which which I I I, I think is 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 a good point. Okay, thank you so much once again. Uh, we'll call it a day today. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, audience. Thanks.